little sparse tonight without all, all of our kids at church camp, but uh, hey, we, we, got, we got some good love here tonight. I want to welcome everybody. So let's go to our Father in prayer as we begin our devotional tonight. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love and your kindness and your gift of your Son, Jesus. So Father, as we come this midweek to rejuvenate our, our spirits, we just pray, Father, that you'll be with Larry as he uh, shares scriptures from uh, the parable of Jesus. And Father, we just pray that uh, we will absorb everything he has and, and learn more about your will for us in our lives today. Father, we pray for our young people and, and uh, our sponsors that are at church camp. And we just pray, Father, that, uh, that they're being filled with, with uh, your wisdom and your love and they're having a good time and will come back and be rejuvenated to, to spend their summer working for you, Father. So, Father, forgive us when we do wrong and be with us through the remainder of this service is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. having a little technical glitch, but we're going to have a song here in just a second, I think. Having to reload sounds like. Reboot. That's never happened at my house. Or office. Or telephone. <laughs> yeah, today. Well, we could have a song. There we go. Thank you. 
No, just one tonight. <laughs> well, I'm older than Doug, so I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Uh, I hope you don't fall asleep tonight because I've got an awful lot to go through. <laughs> uh, a priest, a minister, and a rabbit went into a blood bank and the rabbit said, I'm, I am a typo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, tonight we're studying the new cloth and new wine. Our scriptures are Matthew 9, verses 10 through 17, Mark 2, verses 15 through 22, and Luke 5, verses 29 through 39. Now, I've used the International English Bible, which is a complete Bible uh, retranslated by Church of Christ Greek professors and Christian professors of Hebrew and with the help of Jewish rabbis. So. Uh, in review, the term parable is a Transliteration of the Greek parabole, for para beside or alongside, and bole to through. Parable is a word found 48 times in the New Testament. The parables themselves present clear stories from everyday events that all of Jesus' audiences would recognize at face value. Jesus did not code his teaching to prevent some people from understanding, since all equally understood the imagery, but he used parables as a hidden spiritual meaning from the Holy Spirit, transcending the literal sense of scripture. Those gathered to listen certainly comprehended certain aspects of his parables. Uh, I've my normal scriptures were just the last two of each of those I gave, but I expanded it because the previous scriptures are quite integral to those parables. Let's read Matthew 9, verses 10 through 17. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, behold, Many tax collectors and sinful people came and joined Jesus and his followers for dinner. Some Pharisees saw this and kept asking Jesus' followers, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinful people? When Jesus heard about it, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. Go and learn what this means. I want mercy more than I want animal sacrifices. I came to invite sinners, not righteous people. Then John's followers came to Jesus asking them, why do we and the Pharisees fast so often, but your followers do not fast? Jesus asked them, would it be right for the friends of the groom to be sad while he's still with them? But the time will come when the groom will be, uh, will be taken away from them. Then his friends will fast. No one sews a piece of cloth, which has never been washed, onto an old rope because it would shrink and tear away from the rope, and the hole would become worse. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, for if they did, the old wineskins would break open the wine would spill out and the wineskins would be ruined. Instead, people put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. That was written circa 60 AD by Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew, or as the Jews say, Matt-you. 
and it, his name means the gift of Yahweh. Now turn with me to Mark 2, 15 through 22. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinful people joined Jesus and his followers for dinner. And many of them were beginning to follow Jesus too. Some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law saw that Jesus was eating with sinful people and tax collectors. These teachers continued to ask Jesus' followers, why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinful people. When Jesus heard about this, he said to them, healthy people do not need a doctor, but sick people do. I didn't come to invite good people to repentance, but sinners. The followers of John and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and said to Jesus, why do John's followers and followers of the Pharisees fast? but your followers do not fast. Jesus said to them, would it be right for the friends of the groom to be sad while the groom is still with them? No, as long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. Then his friends will fast. No one sews a piece of cloth which has never been washed onto an old robe. If he does, it will shrink and tear away from the robe. Then the hole will become worse. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the old wineskins will break open. Then the wine will spill out and the wineskins will be ruined. Instead, people put new wine into new wineskins. That was written circa 70 AD by John Mark. John is Yannis in Hebrew, meaning the dove, and Mark, Marcos in Rome, was the god of war. Now turn with me to Luke 5, verses 29 through 39. And as these three scriptures equate, we'll use Luke 5 as our example through the rest of the lesson. Then Levi in his own home gave a big banquet in honor of Jesus. At the table there were many tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and those men who taught the law for the Pharisees began to complain to the followers of Jesus saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, healthy people do not need a doctor, but sick people do. I have not come to ask righteous people to change their hearts. I have come to call sinners. They said to Jesus, John's followers often fast and pray, the same as the Pharisees, but your followers are always eating and drinking. Jesus said to them, can the friends of the groom be sad while he's still with them? However, the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. Then his friends will fast during that time. Jesus told them, uh, Jesus told this example to them. No one takes cloth off a new robe to cover a hole in an old robe. If he does, the new piece of cloth will shrink and tear and not match the old cloth. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the old wineskins will break open, the wine will spill out, and the wineskins will be ruined. Instead, new wine should be put in new wineskins. No one who drinks old wine wants new wine because he says the old is better. This was written circa 60 AD by Luke the physician and his name means light giving. I found it interesting that their names correlate quite well to Christ's teachings. Okay, John's disciples 
still held uncertainty towards Christ's rising popularity. Some surely witnessed his baptism, God sending the dove, and his statement that uh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Notice John's disciples and the Pharisees used the term fasting, revealing Levi or Matthew's feast took place on a Monday or Thursday when Pharisees and Jews customarily observed Jewish fasts or feasts. What were the Pharisees attempting to do in Christ's presence? Maneuver a disagreement between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples? How could Jesus defend the conduct of his disciples without drawing a rebuke from John and his followers? Hadn't John's public endorsement of Jesus started our Lord's ministry? Okay, we'll begin with verses 29 through 32. Matthew took them into his home for a big banquet for Jesus. They saw them there with sinners and began to complain. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Well, let's find out who the Pharisees and teachers of the law were. The Pharisees trace their roots to the second century BC when they were a Jewish sect of the intertestamental period and noted for their strict adherence to rites and ceremonies coming from the old oral tradition, which reflected the law, but was not a good reflection. The Pharisees accepted the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, or the Pentateuch, or five books of Moses, commonly written as, or commonly known as the written Torah, but considered their oral tradition as equally inspired. What happens to an oral tradition? Any comments? <laughs> yes? It tends to change with time. It, it tends to change with time. People add what they think is important, drop what they think is unimportant, forget, or misquote a portion. Pharisees believed in free will and self-determination that they could not possibly cancel God as sovereign, which we agree with. They developed a hierarchy of angels and demons and taught there's a future for the dead, believing in the soul's immortality and believing in retribution or reward after death. However, even with these beliefs, they emphasized ethical, legalistic practices rather than theological, spiritual worship. They were extremely self-righteous and pious. Luke 5, 31, Jesus answered them, healthy people do not need a doctor, but sick people do. And I have not come to ask righteous people to change their hearts. I have come to call sinners. Jesus alludes to the Pharisees' arrogance, religious health, and elitism, but they lost the true meaning and direction of God's law. Let's look at the situation Christ faced. Though Jews study the Pentateuch and the prophetic writings, they adamantly cling to that oral tradition of the Talmud which was put together in 280 from the combination of Mishnah and Gemara. We'll look at the Talmud as it reflects the oral traditions that men wrote about the Old Testament and certainly equates to the Jewish situation during time. And I found some interesting information the changes are similar to Muslims. It turns out Muhammad, which Muslims base their faith on, 
may not have ever existed. It was not written about until 200 years after his death that they equate what he said as coming firsthand from him. I don't think people were living 200 plus years then, but. And there was never a full combination of the, there were like five different writers about him. And that writing did not come out until 926 AD. So they have quite a varied history. So now, what is the Talmud? It's similar to the Catholic Catechism. It's a summary of religious doctrines, though not necessarily biblical, and most are not spiritual. We look at the Talmud 300 AD as it totally reflects the rabbinical activities from the Babylonian captivity, 536 BC to 70 AD. Talmud is both a noun and a verb. It means to learn. It's the basis of Jewish law, or Jewish civil and ceremonial law, and their accompanying legends, which is the oral tradition. It's comprised of the Mish Mishnah and Gamera. There are two versions of the Talmud, though. The Palestinian or Jerusalem Talmud from the third century AD, and the Babylonian Talmud, which dates from the fourth century AD, which however includes post-Babylonian captivity oral tradition. Mishnah was the first major written collection of Jewish oral tradition known as Oral Torah and the first major rabbinic work ordered by Yudha Hanasi, a third century AD rabbi. According to Talmud, persecution of Jews and passage of time raised their concerns. The details of Pharisees' oral traditions from the second temple period would be forgotten. The Mishnah consists of the Sedrim, or six orders, which contains seven to 12 tractates or treatises, maybe I ought to slow down, I'm getting puzzled looks, including 63 masectots, or I don't know where they got this name, webs, W-E-B-S. And this was further subdivided into chapters and paragraphs. Mishnah also indicates a single paragraph of this work, the smallest unit of structure in the Mishnah. And sometimes it's referred to in the plural form as Mishnayat. Gemara, and for those sci-fi fans, not the foe of Godzilla, <laughs> is the foe, or is from the Hebrew, Gemara which means to finish or to complete, and comprises the rabbinical analysis of and commentary on the Mishnah. This, when reading the Jewish Torah, we, re we realize they inserted human desires, arbitrary rules and laws beyond the scope of Mosaic law, making God's law into a totally earthly law. At first, Gemara was an oral tradition and forbidden to be written down. After Judah I, also taught, called, or as we say, Judah the Prince, Yehuda Hanasi, the second century AD chief rabbinical redactor and editor of the Mishnah, which has been studied by generations of rabbis from Babylonia to Israel and the world. These ascribed discussions became Gemara, which combined with Mishnah, produced the Talmud. 
There are six chapters of Gemara. Zerim Moab, Moed, sorry, I was thinking of Moab, Utah. Moed, Nashim, Nezikin, Kachim, Taharat. Now much of our studies uh, of Exodus will, you'll understand in a moment, tie directly to this. Zerim, actually Seder Zerim, is the order of seeds. It was the first tractate concerning the rules for prayers and blessings, and primarily deals with laws of agriculture, produce, and the tithes of the Torah. Moed, or Little Festival, deals with Kal HaMoed, the intermediate festival days of Pesach, or Passover, and Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of, <coughs> Feast of Tabernacles is a Jewish holiday celebrated on the 15th day of the seventh month of Tishri, the seventh Hebrew month approximating our October. The term Tishri refers also to the sixth day of creation when Adam and Eve were created. Nashim means women or wives, is the third order of Mishnah containing family law. Nezikin means first gate, deals with civil matters, largely damages and compensation. Your bull killed my bull, you owe me a bull. Kodashim, holy things, covers services within the temple, such as sacrificial offerings, sacrifice prayers, and the proper procedure for uh, sacrificing animals. And lastly, tahara, purities, is the sixth and last order. This deals with declaring a human being clean or unclean and keeping family genealogically pure. The Talmud occurred long after Christ's death, but reflects those oral traditions. The Talmud is held in equal to higher esteem than God's actual law. Jews cling to the Talmud, men's guiding rules and procedures focus on the physical, action-oriented, and legalistic beliefs. After Babylonian captivity, they overcame, or these beliefs overcame most Jewish spiritually oriented beliefs. Christ wittingly, and our Bibles don't reflect this, but he called them good, depending on your version, good, healthy, or righteous. drawing attention to their lack of true spiritual relationship with God. The Jewish leadership demanded all Jews perform all worship actions perfectly according to the Torah, but heavily stressed their oral traditions. This draws a distinction between teachers of the law and God's law and Christ's reinstituting spirituality. spirituality. Jewish worship came down to strictly obeying the Torah, though heavily influenced by oral tradition, and later by the Talmud's required actions. Ignoring God's original intent, spirituality. Let's look at Luke 5.33. They said to Jesus, John's followers often fast and pray, the same as the Pharisees, but your followers are always eating and drinking. So, Jesus, why aren't you following the law? You're breaking the Torah, 
really meaning our oral traditions, by eating and drinking when you should be fasting. See, John's followers fast, just like all good Jews. Why aren't you following our norm? Christ's actions are condemned, and they consider him an unholy rebel and religious outcast for ignoring oral traditions. Moving on to Luke 5, 34 and 35. Jesus said, can the friends of the groom be sad while he is still with them? However, the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. Then his friends will fast during that time. Of course, we understand Christ is the groom, the church is the bride. And in these verses, Christ actually foretells his own death to a group misunderstanding his description of things to come. It prophesied in Isaiah 53, you would think the Jewish leadership would be able to connect the two, but somehow they couldn't. Jews understand Christ's visualization of groom and a wedding but only on a single logical physical plane. The second plane of Christ's explanation was the crucifixion, not acceptance of Christ as the foretold Messiah. Jews instead rebuke him as arrogant, misguided, and misguided, and ignorant. Yet he confounds their misguided oral traditions at every turn, using scripture, asking leading questions, giving parables, to which they have no comprehension and no reply. They cannot formulate a rebuttal, which causes them to lose face. The Pharisees could never lose face. They were always irrefutably correct. Not. Teaching through parables divided Christ's listeners into two groups based on their own responses. Those religious legalists or atheists who refused to change their beliefs and those who realize this is the Messiah and his message reveals a way his righteous people should worship and relate to God and mankind. Jewish sensitivities arose from these issues. Any listener introduced to Jesus' concepts should recognize that a Jewish audience would refuse to recognize him as Messiah or even a believable prophet. Jewish leadership feels they alone held the only real truth of Old Testament scripture. They guarded it, redefined it, by developing an unrealistic legalism. They then taught to the Jews through Torah's oral tradition during Christ's time, and later incorporating those same traditions into the Talmud. The builder begins a foundation and then stops. What Christ erected at this point looks foolish and anti-Torah to Jewish leaders. A wise king avoids a foolish war and death when clearly outnumbered. Our Messiah does not force his new covenant upon people. Thank you. As Judaism forces oral traditions, Christ asks them to accept it by believing his teachings, miracles, healings, and removal of demons. Excuse me. Let's go on to Luke 536. Jesus told this example to them. No one takes cloth off a new robe to cover a hole in an old robe. If he does, the new piece of cloth will shrink and tear and not match the old cloth. We don't quite have the same problems today with modern synthetics, but you don't tear up a new garment to supply a new patch to an old garment, a combination that will never work and will look ugly. 
Both garments are finally destroyed. The old and the new, the new patch has not yet experienced shrinking. And when applied to the old, shrinks and pulls away, tearing, tearing both. The new is destroyed, giving to the old. And the old is destroyed because it's not in sync with the new. In other words, the gears of the old do not match those of the new. The old is decayed or tattered, while the new is clean, crisp, and fresh. A system may appear well-developed until one actually uses it. And then reality may sit in. Either it works or fails to operate when expected to perform differently. Christ did not adapt Christianity as a new patch upon the old garment of Judaism. Christianity was not designed as an addition to Judaism, not a patch on the old, but as a new fulfilling covenant, reintroducing and focusing on spirituality. A person's behavior reflects his commitment. The old clothing are sinful, selfish, Lives cannot be mended, but must be replaced. The new cloth is righteous life. The Pharisees' ritual fasting was an old garment for which a new piece of cloth was useless. I should say, if you have questions or comments, jump up and down and do this. Larry? Yes. Uh, seems like there's a void to me of where the Jewish teaching came from. Uh, it came from man, from the scribes, the uh, Jewish scribes and all, or, you know, where did it come from? Well, it came from Moses in his first oh, five books. Right. That's right, that's right. But, did it but then, then the prophetic works came, and then they developed the Mishnah and the camera and began writing their own rules. Yeah, and altering it. Yes. And they're still they still follow it today. Yeah, today aren't they? Yeah, I've I've got an example further on. I have a good friend who's Jewish. We've been friends since eighty four and he won't really talk Christianity, but he'll share with me his Jewish thoughts, and it's quite interesting. Okay, Luke 5, 37. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the old wineskins will break open, the wine will spill out, and the wineskins will be ruined. Instead, new wine should be put in new wineskins. No one who drinks old wine wants new wine because he says the old is better. This refers to putting new wine into new bladders or new skins of animals. Only new wine skins could serve as storage for unfermented or new wine as the wine expands during fermentation. The wines back then were not like our wines now. Their alcohol content was about 4%, which ours is about 40%. So there was quite a difference. But isn't Christ referring to he is the new wine and the system that was existing with the old garment? I mean, the Ju Judaism, Judaism was the old garment. Okay, so that was the correlation, I guess. That's correct. And he didn't want to insert Christianity what, right into the middle of the Jewish teaching? Right. He, he was not going to change Judaism. He was bringing, I've got a portion we'll get into in a little bit that will explain it better, I believe. 
because we are still human, remnants of the old man are still within us. And at times the old wine seems better. That's why we keep sinning. The old wine seems more gratifying and comfortable to our senses. Before conversion, we certainly had no interest in new wine because the old wine suited us just fine, even though we were miserable and didn't realize it. Yet, even after conversion, we sometimes reach for that old wine. I'm reminded of the 1978 movie, A Few Good Men, that famous line, you can't handle the truth. Many Jews, especially Jewish leadership, definitely and defiantly did not handle our Lord's truth. And that should be in the present also. Do not handle the Lord's truth. So in comparison between the old and the new, both having identical parts, are considered of the same kind. But the new covenant is so much better and so improved that the old one became obsolete. Only Jesus understood the significance of his sacrifice at that time, which is why many were and still are confused by this parable. The new cloth displays outward conduct and conversation, while the new wine represents the inner aspects of a Christian's life. Let's look at the difference between testament and covenant. The word testament does not appear in English translations of the Old Testament, but appears 13 times in the New Testament. The Greek word is quite interesting because we interpret it as covenant, a solemn and binding agreement. In fact, researchers have only one usage in classical Greek outside of the Bible, where this word's usage is exactly as English and Hebrew words. Usually the Greek word diatik is the equivalent of our English words testament to be a witness and will the power of God to relate his intentions, not covenant a solemn and binding agreement, though aspects are indeed present. When someone comes to the new truth of Jesus Christ, Christianity always conflicts with tightly held old doctrines, old former beliefs, unlearned untruths. There's the world teachings and then there are Christ's teachings. It's one or the other. Both cannot coexist together in one person as eventually one wins out. Many people won't choose in some circumstances. They do exactly what Christ tells them not to. Do not pour your wine, new wine, the gospel of Christ, into old wineskins their old worldly belief system. They simply are not compatible. When it comes to physical matters, human nature's all too readily, I put an extra verb in there, accepts anything new except in spiritual matters. People too readily turn from the new and return to the old comfortable. An example of this, the Jewish friend I was talking about, uh, we talk weekly normally, once a week or bi-weekly. And he called me about a year ago, upset. His nephew was marrying out of the Jewish faith. And he talked about it bringing shame on the family and against the Torah. which shows his deep uh, hand on his faith, but uh, I've tried to talk Christianity with him and he 
knows about Christ to an extent that he will not change. He will not open his mind to it. And that's exactly what Christ was ready into. Okay. Jesus is the new message, our good news. Trying to fit Christianity in the old Jewish religion, law, oral traditions, and their animal sacrifices failed miserably. Christ's audience reaction disgruntled the jealous Pharisees and their scribes, believing they alone held the truth. Christ declares the old and new covenants as different endeavors. His miracles astound many by his teachings of love, compassion, and forgiveness. Those who really commit to, to God seek further understanding, but those uncommitted or committed only to legalism or Jewish oral traditions or atheism reject Christ's teaching as unintelligible and from demons. For those whom Christ transforms, his parables change legalistic dispositions and guide one toward compassion and love. By resorting to parables, Jesus effectively separates true seekers from mere legalistic biased observers. Jesus essentially says, my disciples are not fasting because God is in the process of establishing a new covenant. Jesus describes in his parables, God's establishment of a new covenant just as a new covenant is established at a wedding. I have some related scriptures. Let's look at Isaiah 62, verse 10. And the Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name, which the, the mouth of the Lord shall name. We are that new name. Next, Matthew 16, 13. Then they understood that Jesus was not wanting them, that is his disciples, to stay away from the yeast used for literal bread. Instead, he wanted them to avoid the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And Hopefully we understand why. Matthew 23, 13 through 15. It will be horrible for you, O teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you shut the door to the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You will not go in and you stop those who are trying to go in. Verse 14 is only in some manuscripts. It will be horrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You are hypocrites because you rob widows' houses while you make long prayers for a show. You will receive the greater con condemnation. It will be horrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel all over the world to make just one convert. And when you convert him, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. Hebrews 8, 6 through 13, and this will finish our lesson. Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. But now Jesus has received a ministry that is better than theirs. He makes a better covenant between God and man based on better promises. If nothing had been wrong with the first covenant, then there would have been no room for the second covenant. But God found something wrong with the people. He said through Jeremiah, listen, the Lord says, Time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the family of Israel and the family of Judah. 
It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took their hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not continue with my covenant, so I paid no attention to them, says the Lord. This is the new covenant that I will make with the family of Israel in the future, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No one will ever teach his neighbor or his brother like this. You must know the Lord God. Everyone will already know me from the most important person to the least important person. I will show mercy to their wrongs. I will completely forget about their sins forever. When God said a new covenant, he made the first covenant old. What is old and worn, worn out, is almost gone. Very good, Larry. That was in depth and really gives meaning to that scripture about the old and the new. Got a few announcements. Uh, our sister Latoya Hooks, uh, you know, she had her, her hysterectomy Monday and she's been in some extreme pain. And then I believe it was last night one of her dear aunts passed away as well. I think her name was Aunt B. And uh, she just would really like for everybody to keep her in her prayers. She's had some rough, she's had a rough couple of days, obviously. So uh, keep Sister Latoya really close in your prayers as well as Derek and the kids. Um, I have a little homily I'd like to, to go over with you guys. This, I've, been, I've read this book from uh, Francis Chan about unity. And I thought about paraphrasing this scripture, but I'm just gonna read exactly what he says. After honest examination, we may discover that we are not as humble and loving as we thought. If we don't really love people that deeply, it could be because we haven't experienced the love of Christ deeply. There may be an arrogance or emptiness in our soul that has caused more division than we realize. It might not be everyone else's fault after all. Will we humble ourselves to admit the possibility of pride in our lives that requires repentance? This could turn out to be the greatest discovery of our lives. Humility and repentance always lead to life and grace. It could be that repenting of our pride will lead to a vibrant love relationship with God and others, resulting in a fullness of life that we've never tasted. Colossians 3, 12 through 15. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Let's be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are so glad to be filled with your word. And Father, we just pray for a deeper understanding of that word that we can share with our friends, neighbors, and family members. Father, may we just think on these thoughts tonight and, and try to find ways that we can apply them to us and that we can think about the old and the new and how important it is that we stress the new life that we have in Christ and what it means to us. So be with us as we go through the remainder of this week, Father. We look forward to worshiping 
you again on the Lord's Day this Sunday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed. Thank you.